considering that Dazed and Confused was made this year with its time and place for this year, it'd be equivalent to us making a movie right now about 2005. Huh. Wow. Sorry, say that, that doesn't make any sense. It does, but if I remember the... So Dazed and Confused was made in 1996, and it took place in 1976. I made up those numbers. But what they were saying is it was equivalent to us... Nick, we're doing a podcast. Can you put the phone I'm, away? I'm putting it on silent I have my mode. phone's away. Chris's phone's away. I'm two hours behind. <laughs> my phone's away. Busted. It's like the kids at dinner are like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit. Oh, yeah. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm fantastic. This is Chris Camacho, President CEO. It only took like Jesus. nine tries, right? We did it. It was my fault. I know. Careful. Oh, wow. I can't do it. Got him. Happy to have you. So this is technically episode seven. Is that correct? Seven. No way. Mm -hmm. Who is the best one so far? Chris Camacho. Yes. Yeah, good answer. Pre nailed Pre it. Pre I, I saw the JP one with Ron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Had your buddy Brandon Bell on, right? Oh, you know you Brandon? Did. I know Brandon. Yeah. He was our he was our he behaved himself? No, he's a total degenerate. Uh, I'm yeah. not gonna <laughs> disagree with that. <laughs> he talked about steel. Steel pricing. Yeah. Steel pricing problems. Steel procurement. More steel. We're still talking about steel. I was actually very interested, and nobody else was. You were nerding. You never talked more than on that one, ever. <laughs> he knows I, his steel. This he is, does. This is what I struggle with, so I wanted to know more about it, right? So Steph told me that podcasts die after six episodes. So this is the official, <laughs> we we're not that. dead. <laughs> Matt, Bray, we did it, guys. We're not dead. Made it to seven. Hey, thanks for bringing Lucky us back. Lucky seven. I have a thousand things I want to talk to Chris about. That Start. I let him talk. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I will not use the opener that we discussed. I'm going to sideline that opener um, in case we ever need to get hired again in the future. So there you go. Let's just start with who's Chris? Who is? Did you wake up when you were seven years old and go, GPEC, Phoenix? I'm going to sell the state of Arizona for my career. Killing it. I don't think I could have pointed out Arizona on the map when I was 17. So <laughs> I said seven. <laughs> at seven, I was myopically focused on being a professional athlete. What and, were we going to play? Uh, I was going to play soccer. So my dad played in the North American Soccer League back in the 70s. And I have this picture of him with Pele. So when Pele mm -hmm. played for the New York Cosmos. So uh, back then, he played for a short time. But that was like in our DNA. He had, I think I have seven brothers, seven uncles that played professional soccer and you so that was like you have seven i was thinking it was either six or seven that actually okay. played professionally whatever but seven. yeah seven sounds better right and we're on seventh episode mm -hmm. um yeah time. so so anyway that's what i thought i was going to do was was become a professional athlete and what happened um torn acl no I, I played in college and had a chance to play in the misl the indoor soccer league but i won't bore you with all these details but my first contract offer was pretty much like minimum wage it was that bad like 20 years ago it's an so offer. So a lot of my buddies kept playing, and I hung it up and went back to grad school, and then I thought about GPEC eventually. <laughs> Where did we go to grad school? Uh, SIU Edwardsville. It's on the Illinois side of St. Louis. So, oh. I mean, 20 minutes from downtown. How do we get from St. Louis to Phoenix? So this will surprise people probably. Hmm. I went to Yuma, Arizona. After St. Louis, Lucky. I went to Yuma. Brandon Bell, one of your former uh, podcasters, was, uh, was a Yuma guy. And uh, so anyway, I went down there to run their economic development. Initially, I went down there to become their VP, and then there was some change at the leadership level. And so I was 25 and got to become their CEO for four years. Yeah. And uh, then I came from there where I was doing a bunch of work in Mexico, which is super cool, with Yuma, northern Mexico, bring, trying to bring jobs and create a better identity. Everybody up here has a stigma with Yuma, and I will fight anyone who <laughs> disparages Yuma. It's a great place. <laughs> if you want to unpack that more, let's do that. Uh, it, it was an awesome, it was an awesome time. Uh, but yeah, so I was there for four years and then, uh, my predecessor, Barry Broom, who's kind of one of the heralded guys in our field back in 2008. I mean, you couldn't have picked a better time, right? The Arizona economy was churning, churning, churning. And then we hit 2008 and implodes. Hmm. And so I decided, uh, God, he, to he totally tricked me because he actually said, you know, Hey, you're a superstar and you're playing in the triple A levels. Do you kind of want to come play in the big leagues? You don't tell an athlete mm -hmm. that. And I was like, Damn it. I game mean, I, he got me. Just game on. Uh -huh. And Coming I was like, I'm going to, yeah. So I came up to Phoenix in 08 and uh, had him, you know, six years with him. And then I, I took over GPAC in 2014. So pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, last seven years. So you took it on. What was your, what was the journey? Like when you took it on, I'm sure you had a vision right now. It's going to be my baby. I'm going to make this baby. Mm -hmm. What was it and what has it become? 
Yeah, so my big thing was I wanted to ensure we integrate data, evidence, and, and kind of empirical uh, you know, rule over everything we did. So stay out of politics because it's noisy and it's even worse now than what it was before. And so I wanted to be a group that was like a McKinsey, like a strategic consulting mindset, uh, you know, bring a lot of data to every decision-making process. And ultimately, you know, we've become now the top now international group in what we do in large part because we're, we're viewed as being one of the most data competent groups in the country. And so that was important for me. I smell a nerd. You smell a nerd. Uh, uh, totally. I got you spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't take much to figure that one out. Yes. Uh, I love taxes. So once we could talk taxes, I won't yes. do that today. This but I very strongly person. dislike taxes. Okay. So. Well, oh, man. Yeah. That's, <laughs> this is so exciting. That was my forte, and this will probably be your last episode. But, <laughs> and this is where we die. Yeah. But I'll tell you, it was, uh, I, I think, GPEC for the better, coupled with the market, just yeah, you know, right time, right place, right time. We've seen the market dynamically change to... We're one of the most interesting places in the country now. Uh, deal flow is as active as I've ever seen it. We have deal three, flow. Ooh, 300, I like that word, deal flow. Yeah, 300 companies right now from all over the world are evaluating coming here. What do they it's look amazing. at when they – so I'm born and raised in Arizona, so mm -hmm. I didn't know Arizona's stigmas because I was it. And one of my mom's best friends from New York, she was landing from New York to Arizona. She's like, why did they put so many phone poles out in the middle of nowhere? They, those are cactuses. And she oh. said she was surprised we had running water. So help me. We've overcome a lot. We've got uh, we now have way. running water. Yeah. Nice. I, <laughs> we're now out. a 21st century community with running water. Yeah. Big deal. You know, what's interesting, too, is I deal with this all the time. When I'm dealing with global companies and they're like, oh, how are you building these kind of industries in the desert? How are you bringing semiconductor and advanced water, electronics, water, 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 water? water, water. water. In reality, and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about water, but I'll tell you, we've been at water as a pioneering state for 100 years. We have a 1980 water management plan that's been in place, whereas California launched their water management strategy in 2015. So the fact that we don't have the kind of over leverage requirement on the Colorado River, mm -hmm. it's a huge thing. It's 30% of our, of our water allocation comes from Colorado. The rest is from other surface water assets. So unlike Nevada, 100% of their water comes from the Colorado River. So when you read, like, the national headlines, you think... It's trash Nevada. Yeah, totally. Ugh. And I love, I love Nevada. <laughs> I think we all have bleepers. Yeah, you can bleep that one out. I love Texas and Colorado. No, you, I don't. You don't. We don't. But those are all the enemies. We compete with everyone in the Mountain West. So you make water and you like taxes. This is going really well. I told you I wasn't that no, interesting. He doesn't make water. Let's, well, let's he found it underground. Or we just water. make it rain, right? <laughs> you, you, you step right into that. <laughs> Speaking of rain, waste management. Is it going to rain? Okay. I don't know. Oh, waste management. It's I around mean, the corner. With grass, water, I don't know. The greatest water, show. Water. I want to start keep ripping on the adjacent states. Can we keep doing that? Yeah, let's go back All there. Right. The greatest show on grass the that needs water. The greatest show on grass. Okay, it does need go. water. There's a lot of water. So, yeah, it's right down the road here. Yeah. And in 22, we're back. We're back with full-blown excitement on the uh, on the 16th hole, 17th hole, 18th hole. If you haven't heard, we're doing a really a concert on the Coliseum. <laughs> getting a pitch mode here. Um, <laughs> it, it, if you haven't heard about this, we have <laughs> two major... Uh, Old Dominion and Thomas Rhett are going to be playing right on the 16th hole on the Saturday before the Open. How do we not get Dirks? Isn't he Dirks local? came two years ago. Oh, okay. He oh, rocked he it. So two years ago. Yeah. Okay. He, he's, okay. he rocked it too. He did a fantastic at the Bird's Nest. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you weren't there. Uh, I'm, I have kids. I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I go home. I tell my wife, I do all of this charity work for the kids. You're so and good. And then she smacks me around and says, it can't all be for the kids. No. We have our own. <laughs> Do you want to go back to ripping states, <laughs> I, or what can I do for you, <laughs> Giggly? Well, so we're a few blocks away, right? And it's just amazing to me that they are literally constructing this for like nine months out of the year, right? So it's like they, they start building it, they and then it takes them a couple of months to take it down. It's just unbelievable the amount of things that go into putting it on. It's a really like elementary way of saying it, but to it's be able to like drive past it, it's just under construction constantly. We should just leave it there. Can we leave it? So Bureau of Le Reclamation owns the dirt. So mm. the challenge is putting up a fixed structure and blah, blah, mm. blah, boring details. Yeah. But that's structures. the issue. Yeah, so that's the issue. But, you know, TPC, we're going to be there for a while. And, and, you know, this is the juggernaut on the PGA Tour. They love coming here. The players love coming here. We raise a lot of money for, for charity. And, and in, four, or sorry, in 19, we had $14 million go back to charity because of that event. So Does it stay local? or what It's do you, all, local. all local. All stays here in Metro Phoenix, yeah. Nick it's and I have cool. a new charity we'd like to pitch to you. Well, send it over to me. We will. We yeah. don't have a charity. We don't. We don't. We should create one. We should. What would it do? 
help people. People. <laughs> children. <laughs> children. Lots for of the children. kids. All the kids. For the kids. Well, the even kids. last year, though, it, I mean, with all the restrictions and all the, the, the junk, it, it didn't feel, I mean, it wasn't a bust last year. I mean, mm-hmm. you guys still raised a bunch of money, people right? People really liked it because it was so different. I heard a lot of feedback that it was like quaint, relaxing. It was nice to be outside. I heard a mm-hmm. lot. It was very different. But yeah. I had good feedback by her. Yeah, people loved it. It was easy to get in and out of yeah. and obviously controlled environment. Um, yeah, we were still able to raise a couple million dollars going mm-hmm. back to charity. I was up at uh, in North Scottsdale at the YMCA and, you know, Boys and Girls Club, able to give out some money back to the community. And so even though... He was making it rain. Last year was Got tough. Water. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to be a heck of a year, though. 22 is going to be awesome. So fun. What's something that goes into it that the average person wouldn't understand? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just so much, so many logistics, so much Maybe, logistics. Are there many prisons that you guys set up or anything? We, we have holding cells for yes. those that have too much fun. I, just, um, I know about that. I think Brandon, <laughs> I think Brandon Bell's actually been in a holding yeah. cell. Hopefully he yeah. sees this one. Yeah. Um, but I'd say the, the, the really complicated time is trying to get that many people in and out yeah. of mm-hmm. uh, that site. So you think of the acreage we have available and trying to move people in and out through Uber and Lyft and you know, obviously, bus systems, it's tough. I mean, that puts major pressure on North Scottsdale. So the fact that, you know, the mayor and the city council and city management have been so helpful to us in making sure that we can plan effectively in the you know, public safety, the cops, the fire department. I mean, it, it takes an entire team to, you know, to pull this off. And we're now a national spectacle. I mean, people are eyeing this, like, bucket list, like the Masters, like these other top tournaments. So these, these out-of-country people, companies looking at Arizona, do they know these things or do they not matter? Well, they're additive, certainly. I mean, okay. first of all, these companies want to understand the labor market. That's number one by like one, two, and three. They mm-hmm. want to understand, do we have the talent base? Do we have the modern infrastructure? Uh, you know, do we have a pro-business environment? Uh, politics are politics everywhere, so they're kind of, you know, kind of desensitized to the political shifts. But they really care about having uh, leadership that's going to be able to not only see, th- see them through on their project, but then also, you know, post-project. What kind of community are my employees going to live in? And mm-hmm. so quality neighborhoods, arts, mm-hmm. culture... These kind of events are a complement to all of them. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. Do they like golf? Most of them, yeah. Do they I, like I pitch it every time, and you should see the reaction. Some are like, <laughs> no, I don't care about that. I'm like, well, obviously you're not very fun then, but you should come out anyway. You shouldn't come. <laughs> How do you feel about spring training? Yeah, exactly. We How do you feel about too. NASCAR? How do you feel about, I don't know, the Super Bowl in 2023? It's around the corner. Can you believe it? We're doing a Super Bowl again. It feels like we just did. <clears throat> I mean, it makes sense though, right? I mean, it, it just seems to make sense. Remember the last time we had it? It was NASCAR, Pro Bowl, Super Bowl, and PGA all yep. within. I have a bunch of folks that live in our neighborhood that rented out their house for a the week and like just killed it. I don't know where they went. Yeah, uh, doesn't but matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you think the Cardinals are actually going to yes. be a Super Bowl team? Yes. Don't no. say it like that. Don't. No. It w- like, yes. It should be, don't you think? Like, It'll be easier awesome. for them to get there, but in the stands. It's cute. I mean, we got we got to like stay healthy, mm-hmm. keep Kyler healthy. Hey, we did good. Keep our receiving core good. healthy. We played pretty well this weekend. Didn't like even need play. Kyler. I feel like there's a negative undertone. What no. is? What do you hey, want? Hey, Cole from McCoy him? looked good. No, he did. I mean, he but stepped up. Texas. He's but, not afraid to get hit. Yeah. Yeah. Who were they playing this weekend? I don't know. Somebody not good. <laughs> please, please, please. Yeah. Please, they played the please. Niners. Niners aren't that good. Oh. I think we got what Tennessee coming up. We got a, a few games that are going to test us. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready. I, th- I think our offense is just. I mean, it looks pretty good. And they built a pretty nice cushion in a really, really difficult division. So yeah. we'll see. You want to talk about the Vikings? Is that what you'd like to I, do? I am. I'm a so Minnesota well. boy, so I'm a Vikings fan, and Tough. the Cardinals beat us. So you know, one and two. That's how I look at it. Hey, the they Vikings. They almost pulled off an upset against Baltimore. But they didn't. Yeah. And then they didn't. Didn't. Did not. Kicking did game. Not. Yeah. Same way we lost to the Cardinals, by the way. Kicking game. Mm. Maybe, Maybe we need a that. soccer player kicking field goals. I wish I would have tried that. I offer? wish I would have done that, yeah. I had a decent leg. I think that's maybe top five best jobs in sports. A decent leg. Which one, left or right? You just got to yeah. have nerves of steel. Less surgeries on the right one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you right mentioned hand. surgeries. That, you know, that's the challenge of getting older now. Is like you deal with all. Like I can barely pit pickleball without getting hurt. <laughs> My knees hurt every time we're done playing pickleball. How fun is like, that? You have a big event you do in pickleball. We do. We, that, just, uh, uh, yeah. we do it twice a year. We say it's annual, but it's kind of twice a year because it's really fun. And we mm-hmm. found a way to make it very cost effective. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I look at them like one more. We did one more. Where do you do that at? We did one at JW Marriott, and that was almost like planning a wedding. So that was difficult. Mm. And the other one we did at the Moon Valley Country Club. Okay. Mostly because I could walk home. Mm-hmm. Smart. They did a really good job, though, with food and beverages and music, and it was it was fun. Yeah, it's a fun little golf course too. 
I've only played it once. How pathetic is that? I'm a member. One mm. time. Do you think I played that on my own time? Nope. It was a work. Your, getting your dues out of it, at least. Totes. My kids can play indoor basketball. It just works itself mm. out. That's good. That's Why good. do we have so many semiconductors? Semiconductor companies, so there's a massive trend happening globally. If you're trying to buy any kind of electronics, there's a shortage, right? So, you know, what started probably five years ago was this underpinning of, of geopolitics and U.S.-China race and Taiwan produces majority of these chips globally. And there was a move and an interest of these Taiwanese companies to shift to the United States. And so a lot of their downstream, what they call fabulous companies, so Qualcomm, Apple, all these others, decided uh, they wanted the TSMC and other foundries closer to home. So that started, I think that project was four and a half years ago when we first started working on it, back and forth between here in Taipei and Tenchu. And now we're in a position, we're like the lauded market nationally for semiconductors with Intel's $20 billion investment and what TSMC is going to do to North Phoenix. Uh, there's 44 companies of that 300 I talked about. 44 yeah. of those are semiconductor firms. Yeah, it's insane. So do we have enough water? Yeah, so <clears throat> the... The water conversation, really, if you look at TSMC or Intel as, as two kind of primary examples, uh, they not only utilize and recycle 90 plus percent, but they're the most significant stewards of the environment of, awesome. of any kind of user. So, um, you know, when we're looking at. I think we just had somebody. Somebody jump off the <laughs> ball onto the <laughs> ceiling. <laughs> Everybody yeah. act like that didn't just happen. <laughs> Carry yeah. on, water, I guess taxes. We're going. Water in Texas. So, um, Politics. yeah, I mean, the good news is you have to have suppliers, you have to have so chemical companies, substrate companies, packaging companies. All of them now are looking at this market to get closer to the foundries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then that's going to propel this next iteration of AI to EVs, obviously AVs moving in this market, battery energy storage. We're just hitting the first stride of this, what I'd characterize like an immense movement in industrial technology. This I, is awesome. I feel like Chris is like walking out of the building that like just like the bomb blows up in the background, like we just like dropping the mic, but the building's doing that. And you're just walking in your suit, your tie just kind of goes. Cool. <laughs> that would be awesome. What? Wouldn't that Semiconductor, be cool? not just blowing up. That's bad. Yeah. Okay. I'm really happy. Hey Matt, can we get some nice. special effects? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the glitter fingers. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> so, but that brings up the labor conversation again, right? Because because a lot of the major attraction is these companies are also going to need a labor force to supply. So, as a construction company, we're dealing with labor, you know, challenges every day. Opportunities. Opportunities for mm -hmm. success. Thank mm -hmm. you. How do how are you guys? What's the what's the pitch? Like what what does the Phoenix labor market actually look like? Mm -hmm. We got the people. That's what he says. I, I know. Come I want to hear. I want to hear yeah. more about it. I want to yeah. dig into that. Well, it starts with, predominantly for talking semiconductors, it's engineering talent. They want to understand between engineer? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Structural. Yeah, engineer, yeah, yeah. marketing, I can tell. I can okay. make the semiconductor stand Nerd. up. I like tax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it starts with ASU, and obviously they have a 25,000 student engineering shop, or the Ira Fulton School. So it starts there. Then you have precision manufacturing competency at the community college. And then GCU and U of A and all of these others you know, this market's a sticky market for talent. So people want to come here. And so, you know, generally it starts with running all the analytics on our current, you know, throughput and then our future pipelines. And and we're a top five market now. City, you know, population-wise, City of Phoenix is top five. It's a top 10 economic region. And the other facet that other places don't have that might be a stalwart like Purdue's engineering school is a great school. How many people want to move, you know, to Indiana? Not that many, right? So, we're a place where you have natural inflows. People from California, people from the Northwest, people from Illinois and elsewhere like myself decide to come here. So it's this melting pot of, of ideas, multiculturalism, newness. We have a downtown. We, love it. Yeah. we have a thriving downtown. We have arts. We have culture. Growing up here, we didn't. Like downtown shut down as soon as yeah. 5 p.m. happened. That's, that's why I moved back to Phoenix. Yeah. I always love when people say, you know, what's going on in downtown? I say, go down to First Fridays uh, on Roosevelt Row and just see young people. Yes. You know that are they're concentrating, having a good time, and it's it's a different city, for sure. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. It's super exciting. The and he loves it. Well, and when I first moved here, so I, I moved from Minnesota, and when I first moved, one of the things that I really appreciated about it was that the joke was everybody's not from here, mm -hmm. and it, it became like the the lesser holidays, right? The Memorial Days, the Labor Days, the the whatever. Like you're not going to fly home for Labor Day, and so it really kind of knit a tight group. Um, because it was like you wanted to associate with other people, so you go to a bar where they're and showing the barbecue. football team you like. You do a barbecue, you do whatever, and it kind of created communities. Mm -hmm. And we've and we've chatted about this before, but it almost feels like the communities in Phoenix are really really strong. 
which also builds on, you know, where there's great neighborhoods for these people that are coming and transitioning to Phoenix to live and to, to raise a family. And there's all these attractive things. All of the cities are getting involved, right? Not just Phoenix. It's, it's like all of the cities are getting involved with improving their, you know, just their overall amenities for people to live and stay. It's the quality of life stuff that's coming to, to fruition. It's not just throw up the houses. We have a job. We have a house. We come in. We, you know, you get in your garage. You shut the garage. You go in. This, uh, people are coming out. They're look at like Gilbert, right? Like the downtown walkable. And then you've got you got whatever you want. You can yeah, go, think about Gilbert like ten years ago and the heritage area now. And, yes. Yeah, you know, talking with Sam Fox and other guys and Craig Demarco, others that have gone and invested in these mm-hmm. areas that are doing really well and some of their best. You know, net bars and restaurants are down there. It and was so thoughtful. Mm-hmm. The way they went about it was so thoughtful. It's like they took the Sam Fox concept and just made the community versus like communities there. Let's create the restaurant. Mm-hmm. I feel like they they just somehow tied it all together so beautifully. And there's something for everybody. But but too, what what kind of catapults those communities is really high wage quality jobs. So you go yep. back to what Gilbert was ten years ago to what they are today. I mean, financial services, biomedical, and I'm just saying Gilbert. There's one of 22 communities here, but that's marked change in kind of economic disposition. And that's what's exciting for someone like me from an economic architecture standpoint is imagine 10 years from now, dream 10 years from now what this place is going to be if we do it right. Oh, answer that question. Yeah. I mean, I'm hopeful that we continue to invest in, in infrastructure, number one. We have to... But I have, land here on an airplane. What does mm-hmm. it look like? I land here in 10 years. Tell me what my experience is. Yeah, I think we're going to have more green, more trees, more shade. I think okay. that's one thing because we have to deal with climate. Yep. I think we're going to have, you know, more density. So that's going to be a big change, I believe, for the next 10 to 20 years is infill development, uh, reuse of brick-and-mortar retail in different ways. So around dead spots. Exactly, around okay. multifamily. The density movement is going to happen here, uh, connected through light rail and other means. And so, you know, landing at Sky Harbor, which, again, one of the nicest, easiest located airports of, of big cities in the United States. And um, I, the thing I guard against or I'm thinking about is how do we not become Los Angeles where there's massive congestion, air pollution, you know, limiting quality of life. Those are things that we grapple with with mayors all the time. It's like, you know, if I had to pick one thing that I think we've done well in the last 10 years are cities, and you mentioned this, the cities are doing an incredible job at building high quality standards and building parks and green spaces and protecting them and building quality infrastructure. Um, when I have clients come through here, they're just shocked at the modern position mm-hmm. of our region. It's clean, it's safe. It looks new. It looks new, mm-hmm. yeah. So some of that has to wear off over time, right? But sure. There's still an ability, I think, to maintain this kind of uh, openness, welcoming. Um, Front porches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's you know, I think density is the big thing. that the, There was such a race, and, and I studied this recently, this movement towards, in like the 1980s, there was this, you know, race to wherever you could buy, right? So mm-hmm. they used to talk about drive to you could buy, and it was urban sprawl, and it was cheap dirt, and it was kind of like the gold rush in California. What's changed, though, is now we're seeing uh, those home buyers wanting to find those better amenities, more cultural dynamism, mm-hmm. more it's not just accessibility. The house. Exactly. Yes. So, you know, I think I think our communities have just you know Answer really that. driven quality. Yeah, it's an it's an impressive place from a regional perspective. It was interesting being from the West Valley to watch Verado come to life because I think when Verado first landed, West Valley people didn't we didn't understand it. We were like, what is? It was almost it felt like Anthem. It was going to be out of town. It was going to be its own thing, but it wasn't. It was instantly. It had a main street. Like, what a concept. The kids. And so I started to watch the other West Valley communities drive to that just to have dinner at the pizza place while the kids played in the park. And it was kind of like a sample set of, like, what this could be. And there were front porches for the first time. People didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was, like, our sample set of Gilbert. You know what I mean? It was like that. How do we create that Midwest-type environment, like, small-town feel in a huge city? Mm -hmm. I I definitely feel like the... The future, a lot of the near-term growth is going to be out west because that's where the privately deeded land is. And and yet I think of these cities, like you're talking about, have built quality standards and quality communities where it's, I hope the next trigger is not just about growth for growth's sake. Like uh-huh. it shouldn't matter in my mind, and I'm careful where I say this, but I'll say it because I don't really <laughs> care that much, is you know, this shouldn't just be about measuring our success and population growth. It should be about economic dy- dynamism, the quality of the job, the innovation intensity, are we starting new companies? Are we growing and scaling new enterprises that become public, that create you know, wealth, intergenerational wealth for our mm-hmm. community? And as much as I love to you know, pat the politicians on the back about population growth, that's one measure. We should be thinking about GDP per capita. We should be thinking about income growth for households. So you know, again, we have so much tailwind compared to other places. And again, I, I still think our best years are yet to come because we're like the 
I'd, I'd almost characterize like the the lanky teenager. We're like six nine. We got a lot of talent. Waiting for we're kinda, our muscles to come in. Yeah, we're kind of skinny. More we protein. need more protein. We need to hit red line a little more. Hit the gym. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're gonna be really dynamic in about you ten years. You just wait. Yeah, these we're already are strong. Yeah, we already got a lot of people eyeing us and recruiting us. But I just I think the next ten years we're just gonna continue to improve and the acceleration mm-hmm. of this innovation economy is happening and it's it's just gonna be awesome to be a part of. Nick, how do you feel about um, Chris Camacho for president? I already voted. Right you in, did? right in candidate. You did? Yeah. Why not? So that's crazy. Now. These innovative <laughs> companies are any of them? Are you seeing a lot of innovation come from within? Are there any hometown kids out here that are succeeding and and like really kind of pushing the envelope? Oh, there's a lot of those, and I think that's what often gets overlooked. Is I'll give you two quick examples. So you know, Nextiva right down the road here in Scottsdale. You know, they they are now a unicorn company, billion dollar valuation to uh, a, car, a company I don't know anything about. I think their their name was yeah, I can't remember exactly. It's a it's a an app that allows for students to find parking near universities, mm. and they just obtained twelve point five million dollars. It's it's their students at ASU just graduated, put this model together. And I'm sure because they're having trouble finding you know parking around ASU. Solve the problem. And and you know so to me like that's what Michael Crow has built at ASU. This kind of, of uh, student body focused on ingenuity, on problem solving, critical thinking, and and, you know, the, the Ira Fulton School, again, you know, 15 years ago was a couple thousand students. Now it's the largest engineering school in the country. Well, engineers and, and you know, biomedical students as well as, as docs that are, are sitting in these programs are, are the preponderance of who creates new ideas that create new companies. Wow. And so if we drive that intensity, I mean, to me, that's, that's going to be one of the components of our success. Do you know, pop quiz, do you know if those students are staying in Arizona? Yeah, so the latest numbers I saw were 71% of, of, of Arizona's. Uh, Ashton you know, That's, that's got to be unprecedented. That's, that's got to be a, that, that sounds like a but crazy they can buy stat. they a house. They can have a job that pays them well. They can yeah. yeah, I don't know if you're U of A or ASU, but I love talking about this for with our U of A friends. Is a majority of that student body from Tucson comes to Phoenix for work for opportunities. Because of the health The job opportunity. <laughs> 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 yeah, all my U of A guys are like stabbing me right now. Like, I can't believe you said that. But that's that's the math. I mean, it's yeah. we're a sticky place for jobs. And I think the one thing that's changed in my time here, you know, again, even when I came here in 08, it was still kind of known for customer service, lower lower end uh, jobs in that kind of corporate services value chain. Today, we're seeing headquarters, the higher end of the corp- corporate services market. It's everything from, you know, fintech to blockchain to uh, IT, cybersecurity, those kind of units now are here. Up the road, we had just actually up the road from here, um, companies like Choice Hotels decided mm-hmm. to move their headquarters yep. here mm-hmm. and nationwide right up the road. So they're all over the place. I mean, we're seeing like 50 new major companies come here every year now. It's, it's very incredible. confusing if you don't <coughs> understand that the Choice Hotel is the corporate office because it's 100% glass and you see Choice Hotel and I'm just thinking like, who's the choice person that's staying there with the glass hotel room on the freeway? They don't have hotel rooms there. It's mm. their corporate office. Corporate office, yeah. But if you don't know that, it looks pretty risky. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Show up, knock on the front door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't Any vacancy to tonight? Blinds are closed. <laughs> yeah, maybe they don't have those two-way glass things. I don't know how that works. 71%. I, that's like just we're hitting sticky. me in the face. Like, I, that's unbelievable though, right? I mean, so do you have any comparative fun stats? Mm. Like, like, I like this rapid fire. Well, uh-huh. I mean, so my opinion uh-huh. would be that Maybe one of our larger competitors has got to be Texas, right? That's that's got to be like one of the like larger Austin, competitors. Typically. So, I mean, does UT carry a similar stat to that? I mean, that sounds like a bonkers stat. Yeah, I don't know uh, UT Austin's number. I bet it's comparable though, because Austin's Man, like Austin's young tech market mm-hmm. and even large scale tech market is, you know, comparable you know to this region. So even though they're you know not they're probably a little bit more than half the size in terms of cooler. population, absolutely, but. Yeah, they, they have done a great job at cultivating environment, you know, and you know, certainly cultivating culture. So we're kind of one and two right now as, as the top eyed market for technology firms, which is, I couldn't have said that 10 years ago. There mm-hmm. would have been an, a, a number of other for, or another markets across the country. So are we competing differently now? Like, like, it, like are you competing differently now? Ooh, Do you walk into the change. room with a pile of mm-hmm. swag as opposed to a pile of pleases? Yeah, I think oh. you, you walk in with a little, little swag or a yeah. little confidence mm-hmm. that, you know, when you have this number of high quality companies like we announced Gulfstream today. Gulfstream's MRO could have gone anywhere on the West Coast. Their CEO talked about it today so that exciting. they decided to come to Mesa. And you know, there'll be another probably 30 projects we'll announce in the next quarter and a half. It's that much activity. So, you know, to me it's 
we're for, it's a fortuitous time, but I'd also argue like back in 2011, we worked with the legislature, the governor, a lot of folks to build an intentional roadmap on this innovation economy, and we're executing that plan. So it's by no accident this is happening, but I look at like, how do we accelerate this so that in 10 years from now, it's even more high quality jobs, but we've also kept kind of this, I want to say small town feel, but we've kept this kind of quality of life, the standard that, that we've part. had. Oh, I love that part. That you we know talk people. about that all the time. It's a big small town. Yeah. Like you know people, and yeah. you treat people in a way that it, they're not disposable. Mm -hmm. It's. I have to tell you a secret about Chris. I just remember this. So I am <laughs> mid sentence. A, yes, it just remembers right now. <laughs> I'm a forced extrovert. Like I, in big crowds, like I have to push myself to like be social. It's very intimidating for me. Chris and I went through the honorary commander program together a few years ago, and they do this overnight in, don't be jealous, okay, in Gila Bend. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's actually, it's beautiful. beautiful part of the state, mm -hmm. yeah. The little hike thing was he, gorgeous. Been in Yuma one, too. Yeah, yeah, We yeah. could have just popped down the I-8 there and been in Yuma, yeah. Mm -hmm. We were close. Took a wrong turn. So we're sitting there, and all of a sudden I start realizing that, like, I'm like a, a wallflower in that big of a group. And I every time I looked over it, like, kind of like Chris was next to me, I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's quiet, too. You are not a normal, like, what people, I think, would think that you are. Mm -hmm. That you're just going to walk around and say hi to every single person. You're very much a processor of the room. Strategery. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just terrified. I think he was thinking. I was just scared and biting my nails in the corner. And, and that's rocking. why I can't run for president. Right? You can, though. No, no I'm, I, I'm not. You can do whatever I, I'm a, you I'm a want. tweener. So, like, I'm not, like, in that kind of setting. I mean, yeah, I'd love to talk. I like to talk to people. But I'm not going to go out of my way to go work the room because, uh, yeah, you know, it's just they not, not my you. jam, right? You so, don't chase, you attract. No, I wouldn't say that either. That sounds terrible. I just so. heard that one. <laughs> that was so <laughs> good. I don't chase, I, I attract. attract. No. It's like a light with a moth. I, just do something uh, No, that, no comment to that. Not to, I, I, he I talks don't to everything. Yeah. If there's a human or a receiver of anything, Nick's mm -hmm. saying hi. Or not a receiver. It'd just be. I have a corgi. He ran like, hi. Mm -hmm. We haven't said hi yet. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Nick Feldman, hi. <laughs> Do you want to be friends? Takes all time I, to be successful, right? I, mean, I wish on. I had more of that. I want to hide in the corner. I just seventy-one percent. I I just I can't I can't I can't get off this. Water that just drives. That's I'm, I'm going to send you a lot of data oh, that will gosh. just shock you. This this place is like coming in, into its own. I love it. There's so some, how do we how do we protect? So so it's like as you start to grow, right? Mm -hmm. As you start to succeed. Here comes a small town boy. How do you? How do you not change it? You don't like things. No, like I, I think growth is good. And I think that Phoenix has done a nice job of maintaining. I mean, we joke, we call it the biggest small town in America. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if that's a thing, but like, that's what we say. So I, how do we, how do we protect and, and keep the path going forward? What are the risks, I guess, mm -hmm. would be a question that I have. I think the biggest thing we're going to deal with, and this is not a political statement, but it's reality mm -hmm. is, you know, the climate's changing and I don't know what's causing it, but it's getting hotter. For, for a lar or more significant number of days per year. And so you think about adding more people, more industry, um, to a warm place with limited natural resources. Like, those are things we have to grapple with, mm -hmm. I think, for our future generation, our kids. Like, and so to me, that's probably the biggest X factor. It's how we manage uh, growth going forward. And, again, I, I'd state that I think our communities, our, our arts and culture scene, our concert scene, our sports scene, all have gotten tremendously better. Uh, but by the same token, I think about how do we ensure that, you know, if we have 90 days over 110 in the future or more, like what kind of community, you know, how, do, how do we live in that environment? And I think there's going to have to be really intentional technology strategies that help improve that. Um, you know, I think the people side is really unique because you, you truly have a melting pot here in the West with a lot of Midwesterners, a lot of Californians. Um, so like six people born in Arizona. Hey. If you mesh that together, you know, I, it's a it's a unique <laughs> melting pot. It truly is. But it also brings. I love when people talk about the politics and all that. And in reality, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna be a purple state for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as we kind of lean out, what kind of community we are in the next. But I mean, we're growing by eighty to hundred thousand people every year. Are we still at the? I think I read once it was three 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 a day. Seven days a week moving to Arizona. Mm -hmm. Is that ish? Three, three, three. Yeah, 333 it's, it's people somewhere a day moving to Arizona. Say between two and yeah, 350 a day, something like Jeez. that. Jeez. Mm -hmm. That's insane. We started moving Every, we, we want to buy trucks? <laughs> where, where are they going to live? So, the, But the conversation of melting pot may, I mean, maybe it'll keep going with people continuing to come, but 
Let's go 71%. If you're hanging on to these kids, that, I mean, and they ain't leaving. you're hanging on to these people and they're leaving. That that may start to change. I mean, at least you're not going to be the only unique yeah. person in the room here pretty yeah. soon. I, I do wonder, like, so say fast forward 20 years, and if that sticks where more people are from here, decide to stay here long term, um, do you be, you end up having like an anti-outsider mentality? Like no one, no one talks about that today because you know today we're just accepting we're My easy place to be new, all those things. And I just wonder, at some juncture, do we have like a pushback against the system that hey, we don't want any more growth? I mean, you're seeing that in some respects with multifamily in, in certain pockets where like community activism is as active as it's mm-hmm. ever been. And my argument is like, look, we need to be more vertical because we need to have infill, and otherwise we're gonna have massive sprawl going out mm-hmm. to the suburbs of the suburbs, and that's not good for the environment. Mm-hmm. It's not good for you know, transportation requirements. So those are things we have to grapple with mm-hmm. coming forward. But I'd, I'd take these, if you even call them headwinds, I'd take these challenges, mm-hmm. t- pick another place one. in the country that's got everything going their way. I mean, there's no there's no place that's perfect. And so I think our tailwinds well outpace everywhere else. Mm-hmm. Favorite restaurant? I was just at uh, El Choro last week. Mm, I love the outdoor amazing? patio there. That's fun. And the mountain view. Yeah, I like a Hillstone for lunch. I'm a big fan of Hillstone at lunchtime. There's that just was so an many. Easy one. You got to give us a better one. Um, okay. <laughs> Everybody can say Hillstone. Come uh, on. Let's just say, yeah. I'm thinking lunch. I, I'd like okay. their lunch. I like uh, Carolina's, mm. uh, which that's a Best staple beans here. Best on the planet. Yeah, they're the red machaca. Mm. Yeah, like in the last five years, yeah. I just can't eat too much of that. But man, it's so yeah. good. So just good stay, going down. Don't just don't lay down. Uh, exactly. Got to keep the indigestion. Yeah, you can like taste that for like four days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, there's so many great restaurants now, which is again, that's another unique thing. If you know, fifteen or ten or fifteen years ago, you'd come here and, and I'd almost say it's like big box retail. Mm-hmm. You had big box everything here. Mm-hmm. Now it's the, the local flavor. Yes, is it's everywhere, so exciting. and it's all over the valley. It's not just in Central. It's not just in Scottsdale. Mm-hmm. I was over in Goodyear last. It was Goodyear last week, and Goodyear Avondale seeing a lot of that action mm-hmm. too. So it's cool. What do you and the kids and the wife do for fun? Favorite thing. Well, we like to travel, but every every weekend right now we're we're doing soccer, flag football, volleyball, mm-hmm. every Sports weekend. Wagon. And I kind of I love it. I love being outside. But I'm, I coach, mm-hmm. and like my intensity comes mm. through, <laughs> and it's seven. so hard to like <laughs> be a good dad and be positive because I it's, can't be both. You can't be both. It's hard to be both. But I, I mean, I love. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things is being out with the kids, coaching and all that. And But we like to travel. I was, I was saying my wife and I just got back from a couple trips, which is fun. And, uh, so Spain? You said Spain? Went to Spain for a week. And then, uh, yeah, we got we just went to Mexico was that two weeks ago. So When I met you, you hadn't ever gone to Mexico, if I remember right. Or you were talking about going there. to Rocky Point? Oh, I've never been to Rocky Point. <laughs> okay, You're right. Say, I'm not totally off. Uh, I was make like, it I haven't up. been to Mexico. No, I I, Rocky Point. I'd only, I've only been one time to Rocky Point. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, that was great. I liked it. I, I have an issue. So my dad grew up in Mexico. So I'll, I'll give you this side story. Okay. And and he you know came to the United States when he was a teenager. He was one of these. He you know, didn't speak English till he was a teenager. You know, till he moved here. And um, one of the things that always you know, struck me, he would say constantly, is it's hard for him to go back to Mexico and see the poverty. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to see. It's hard to see. And so I, I remember there. driving down to Rocky Point, and you see some of the Saluita or whatever the community is. So I always like stop, and I just feel like I just want to give everything away because yeah. I feel like we're so fortunate. Uh, but Rocky Point, I think, has tremendous potential. It's an awesome mm-hmm. location. It's easy to get to, and uh, Las Palomas is that what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's resorts. fun. Yeah, it's like a little Vegas on the beach now. Mm-hmm. All the little resorts. Name. Can you go to a city and not think about its potential? Oh, is here that we possible go. for you? <laughs> He's like, and then you <laughs> workforce. Yes. Mm. The worst is when you go and meet what the people like me in other places. And I'm like here in their strategy, and I just want to like dive in and help. And they probably don't want any help, but didn't ask for it. I just feel like you know we've seen a lot. We've seen a yeah. massive bus cycle, a catastrophe financially in 2008 to 12. We've seen you know resetting a policy. We've seen massive growth. We've seen major industry transformation. So you know I, I go back to my hometown in Illinois and spend some time with them, with the mayor, and I'll go back to St. Louis and talk to my my colleagues there. And it's hard not to shed. That's like any industry, right? It's it's, it's one of those things. You just want to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a camaraderie there, though, too, right? Like, just a, it's a, you guys are kind of fighting the same battle, even though you're competitors, so to speak, right? right? Yeah. So, Chris said something to me when we were waiting for you to get off the phone and join us. Um, Rude. That was a shot. Rude. Just, but I'm glad. Just three minutes after, we were were good. We're good. Somebody's got to pay for the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Touche. So, he said, had I known what I know now about what COVID 
like the amount of shutdown time, I'm assuming is where you're going with that. I would have done so many things different. Do, Ooh. And I would, don't tell me. <laughs> Wait, what would you have done different? Well, you really set that up like it's a profound answer here. I know, right? <clears throat> so I, I wish I would have predicted how long offices were going to be closed. Because if you remember, that first tranche was like, okay, maybe it's going to be a couple weeks. Two weeks. Right? And it was like, okay, and we're going to be And that was a big away. deal. How are you not going to work gonna for operate? two yeah. weeks? And then we went to like this Zoom for two like... Two years. Yeah. I mean, at least <laughs> I, I, I was still like an optimist thinking, okay, we're going to be back in like yeah. two months. Yeah. And I remember having like drag out arguments with my team about like, hey, we can be back and we can be safe and all these things. And I was like 0 for 9 on return to office <laughs> strategy. <laughs> And so I wish I would have traveled more and probably anchored myself in different locations. I had a couple of friends that very quietly moved to other countries and still were plugged in via Zoom, and they, they, didn't, they weren't meeting face-to-face with anyone. And so mm-hmm. I just wish I – I mean, one moved to Mexico City, another moved to Argentina, and I was like, that would have been you – Where know, would you have gone? That's a great question. You know, one place I love, uh, probably of all the places I've been, is uh, Cartagena, Colombia. Mm-hmm. Very historic. If you ever get a chance to go, it is the most beautiful – downtown setting obviously a lot of history there so it was i'd say that's top of the list he wants to stand at the top of the mountain and go colombia yeah colombia. maybe rio i liked rio too but it's not as safe as uh colombia. that's a great answer i didn't think about that but that's 100 percent correct because now what you see is people trying to kind of do it late so to speak right where, where it's all of a sudden like you know they forget to turn the background off and they're absolutely <laughs> sitting in the middle of a wood somewhere and it's like ah that looks pretty awesome can we talk about Pop that for a minute tip. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I but, saw I saw a meme the other day, or maybe it's a video of the guy. He's got a full green screen in the back, and he's got a computer that he's wearing, and he's at the golf course. <laughs> but he's amazing. on, you know, he, he's looking like he's typing, talking to people, and he's actually at the course saying, yeah. "Hey, I'm got to finish this meeting to get to my next one." And he's getting ready to tee off. That's what we need those ASU kids to yeah. figure out. Pretty green impressive. screens for everything. Makeup. Maybe. I'm not putting makeup on ever again. There you go. The screen has it. That's a good point, though. I think a lot of people might have done a similar thing, just like find a different location and just be there. So you think it would be all around travel. That's the thing you would have done different. You didn't say I would have created a faster cure or anything like that. Oh, come on. (laughs) That's an unfair. (laughs) I might have taken the time off to cure cancer. Hey. (laughs) Jeez. Let's race to the bottom here. We're losing it here. We're losing it. The wheels are falling off. (laughs) Should I let him do his my famous question? Are you something on the tip of your tongue? No, I seventy one percent. I just um, that blew me away. I've I've failed to have productive thought since I heard that. <laughs> it's all I can think about. Do you want me to give you a minute? No. Are you sure? I'm good. Chris, do you have a question for us? You know, I did ask this question earlier. I'm just I'm sitting here in the the Venn Studios totally. at the Ice Den, mm-hmm. totally. which I've been numerous times and did not realize there was office space here. And so I walked in the Ice we Den. Took it all. Well, I walked <laughs> in the Ice Den. I'm more. like, I'm pretty sure she told me it's at the Ice Den. So then I go to the bar and almost stopped, but I kept walking. Thank you. And then, there's one here. There is very. Yeah, well, then they say, well, just go around the corner. So I go around the corner. It's like an outdoor bar. I was like, maybe this is fortuitous. This is I should just sit down and enjoy Somebody my afternoon. Going to tell you something. Yeah. So then I came around the corner, and then your views of the ice and views of the McDowell's. I but mean, you got to work out in though, right? You have to I look did. at the people in the eye at the at the mountainside downstairs. Yeah, they oh, have I to see you walk too. past. And then they said, "You're not strong enough to be in here." So judgy. Like, okay. Oof, right. You must be going upstairs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're not one of our type. Of nah. Yeah, Tom Haddon would love that one. Yeah. yeah. Should put on a fire pole and get right down there. But wait, I didn't Do hear a Do a quick question. set, get back up. I didn't hear a question in all that. Oh, I mean, I, I was curious, like, how did that all transpire? How are you oh. here? Oh, of yes. Of all places, yeah. I told him the real answer. You can tell him again. Friends. You were squatting. Kind of. That's what she said. <laughs> yeah. She didn't elaborate. I said either. She friends. said he's squatting. I was like. <laughs> we might start paying rent next if week. If you ask before you take, is it actually squatting? So, yeah, we added on to the building 2011? 11. And we utilized this space, which had been vacated by the Coyotes, to use it as our construction office um, and had a really, you know, obviously great relationship with the ownership of the building. Richard and Taylor Burke, the president at the time, Michael name Hearn. Drop, name, um, drop. name drop, name drop. And, what, uh, what group are they? What is the name of the group? Rainy Partners. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were joking with me at the time because the space was vacant, right? We were just using it as a construction office. Like, well, you spend so much time here. Why don't you start paying rent? Um, we're thinking about it. We're thinking years. about it. We, the business was growing. We needed a space to to live, and and uh, it really worked out. And I think we've actually had a couple of open jobs with the Ice Den and their partners every single year since mm-hmm. we've been in business, which has been you know just over eleven years here now in the Valley. And so it's been a wonderful relationship. And then we expanded last year. Uh, we were kind of bursting at the seams, 
and were a little bit sad because we thought we'd have to leave. Um, but it worked out that there was a, another tenant vacating, and uh, and the guys came over and made us a made us a deal we could not pass up, and so we expanded. So mm. when we made this decision, we have a lot of space now. And one day I nerded out on like, how much space do we have for the people that are actually coming here to this office every day? Do you want to know what that is, Chris? Hit me with it. Okay. You mean the square footage that's listed on the drawings? 600 feet <laughs> per person. That's spacious. It's very spacious. We very COVID friendly. 33.3 uh -huh. plants per person and 3.6 chairs per person. Big butts. Uh -huh. I don't think it counts these either. <laughs> Play the music. All right. Uh, these are extra chairs. These are extras. Yeah. They count. Wow. We have a lot of space. If you have any, well, you can incubators. grow into the space. That is great. the plan. But then there's the whole don't want things to change. Then there's that thing, right? Like the family table is the family table. There's all those things that we work through. Mm. Those are opportunities for exploring Growth. discomfort. Mm. I like to add to the team. Somebody's very hesitant to do so. Selective. Selective. Aren't you glad I asked that question? Now? Yeah. This conflict. We can work through this. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. How are you at conflict resolution? <laughs> All right. Okay. I enjoy conflict. I had it right, <laughs> my meeting right before then. I just like conflict. I didn't say resolution. <laughs> Second half. Peek in the pit. What is your favorite thing about what you do? And what is your least favorite thing about what you do? So I'm going to give you a corny answer, but it's true. Oh, here we go. Not people. I actually love working for the community. Oh. Like, I really do. Like, I'm inspired. I left GPEC in 2013 and ran a tech company right down the road here. Okay. And uh, I ended up going back to GPEC, and it, we ended up selling. We sold that company, but I went back to GPEC, and I didn't realize like I'm wired like this altruism side of like affecting the community. Mm -hmm. So like when I drive around like with my kids, and we're driving out to say the Coyotes game, or you know driving out to West Side or wherever, and I see buildings nationwide to choice to going around the. I mean, so many projects we've had uh, you know, impact on, mm -hmm. and then you see people driving up for work, and it's families, it's livelihoods that you've affected, and so. That's cool. Not everybody, you know, gets that, you know, uh, opportunity. So see it all come together. I say corny, but it's true. No, I love that. That's perfect. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Least favorite. Least favorite. Probably the politics. I was saying, does it rhyme Gosh. with schmolitics? Yeah, schmolitics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so tribal today that like good people attempt to go in and fix it, and mm -hmm. then they get absorbed in it. And it's I think there's still a lot of good people in it, but it's just hard. It's mm -hmm. hard to try to be a leader in these parties when, you know, the the people at the top are controlling the, the party message. And I love, I actually love this part of my job where I can just go on blast and say, look, this is what the math says. And here's empirical evidence. I <laughs> here's don't my care. data. I don't care. I don't care what you, you know, you think or you think ideologically, like let's talk about what will move the market. That's awesome. And usually people come to the middle sometimes when, when you have evidence and math and sometimes it just doesn't work. So I think that's probably the part that just, I learned that the hard way probably a decade ago when I thought, I've got this great policy that's going to drive high wage jobs and all this excitement. I take it down to the Capitol and start spreading it around. And people are looking at me like I have three heads and they're like, you're insane. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's pragmatic. It works. Even politically, I didn't think it was going to be harmful for either party, but it, it was too hard to get done. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's the the downside. But again, the good news is we're like an arm's length from it. So I don't mm -hmm. have to deal with and it's not as bad in Arizona, honestly, as probably some other places. Yeah. Do you think that's changing, though, when you said the purple? I don't know what I think about that. I think there's, like, more complexity. You know, the centrist, and I don't even say it's centrist. I just think there's there's probably a, a split between Republicans and Democrats now in our state that's more evenly divided. Mm -hmm. Certainly here in the metro, maybe not statewide yet. But, you know, what does that mean for the long term? I mean, I, I still think we'll be launching these imperatives coming up December 1st, and we're talking about, you know, modernizing the tax system and making it continue to make it balanced and continue to make it competitive. Well... People infer different things by that statement. And it's not just about tax cuts or tax increases to invest in what you want. It's a combination of things. And so that's, again, I'm probably losing an audience member right now. 71%. But, yeah, go back to that. It, it's, <laughs> it truly is like it, it's a puzzle of trying to get policy done. And I mean, when people say it's the sausage making, mm -hmm. it truly is. And you get to see it firsthand. But the good news is I don't have to work in it. I just get to try to affect it. Very cool. Yeah. What do your kids want to be when they grow up? I think my daughter wants to do something in the medical field. My wife's oh. in the medical field. She's like a helper, helpful person. Mm -hmm. um, so she definitely has that gene. My son's, I don't know. I don't want to look back <laughs> on this one by the day. river. <laughs> my youngest is like a spitting image of myself. My wife would say, my mom would say it as well. He's just like hard-headed. He's 
doesn't like to take direction. We're know, learning more. All these things that I'm sure I was like and I've tried to move on from, but you know, it's uh, my middle son might be an athlete. I don't know. He's 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 built like one. We'll mm-hmm. see how we'll see how that all manifests. Aww. Yeah, it's fun. Kids at these ages are a blast, so though. Fun. It's so yeah. fun. Yeah. What are you looking at my cat for? It's your line. Are we done? I mean, it's your line. Okay. It's what you got to do. What do we do now? <laughs>